Ascites, uh, I think we should talk about the same. So it's ascites that cannot be mobilized. So that cannot be mobilized or in which, sorry, or in which uh, early recurrence occurs uh, after being uh, paracentesis and so that cannot be prevented with uh, therapeutic strategies. In essence, we consider two uh, options or two uh, situations, the diuretic resistant ascites in which ascites cannot be mobilized despite having intensive diuretic therapy and this is defined as a maximum of spironolactone 400 milligrams and furosemide 160 milligrams which is quite a lot I must say personally that I never get to that extent the other category is diuretic intractable ascites in which you cannot mobilize ascites due to diuretic uh, related complications such as renal impairment such as uh, diuretic induced hyponatremia, diuretic induced hepatic encephalopathy, uh, hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, and invalidating muscle cramps. Okay, how does refractory ascites occur or ar arises? Well, in that, um, for that we need to go back to the peripheral arterial vasodilation hypothesis, which in essence is based around two components. First, there's the intrahepatic resistance to portal flow. And then on the other hand, there's the other component of splanchnic vasodilation, which leads to effective hypovolemia and systemic hypertension, which reflects activates neurohumeral systems to accumulate sodium and water uh, from the kidney. This is a, a perpetuum mobile, so it goes on and on and on, and in fact ends up with refractory ascites as an end result.